So just uh, to give you the list of our sponsors, so uh, UNESCO on uh, Complex System Institute, uh, Telecom Paris Tech, uh, Ile de France, uh, Lix Department and Ecole Polytechnique. We have two uh, CNRS uh, network, uh, MIA for Mathematics and Image Analysis and uh, ISIS for uh, Signal and Image Processing. Uh, SMAI, which is a mathematical society for industrial application. Uh, the group uh, Thales, uh, the Leon Briouin uh, seminar. And we have collaboration with Springer for the, the edition of the proceedings and also with Entropy with a special issue after the conference. So about just a few words about our logo. So, uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, this is from this piece of uh, an Adelard of, of Bat uh, Latin translation of Euclid elements. So uh, why Adelard of Bas? Adelard of Bas was the first translator in Latin of uh, Euclid elements. So he has uh, he was uh, he give lectures in UK, in France, in Tours, on Laon, and also he, he, he traveled to uh, lands of Crusades, so uh, Greece, West Asia. And he has also the first introduced the word algorithmus in uh, Latin. So Adela of Bat is our uh, emblem or the logo of uh, GSI. And, and we have a woman, and this woman is a symbol of geometry. <laughs> So we have more than uh, 150 uh, attendees from uh, 15 uh, different countries uh, with uh, uh, 85 uh, scientific presentations on three days. So we have three keynote speakers, uh, Mathilde Marcoli, two days, uh, Tudor Ratiu uh, tomorrow, uh, no, Friday, and Marc Arnaudon uh, tomorrow. We ha will have a short course that will be shared by Roger Ballion and given by Dominic Spiner on uh, geometry and the set of uh, quantum state and quantum correlation. And we have a guest uh, speaker, Mr. Charles Michel Mar from uh, Université Pierre and Marie Curie. And uh, uh, we will have uh, two social events. We will have a cocktails at Ecole Polytechnique today. And uh, tomorrow we will have a, a dinner at uh, in Versailles Palace Gardens. So GSI has been uh, created to federate different topics, especially uh, interrelation between geometry, probability, and information theory. So here you have the list of the session of this, uh, of, uh, this year uh, conference. Uh, so try to be curious and try to, to attend uh, the different session and try to discover uh, other topics at your research uh, domain. So you have a book, uh, booklet in your sacoche, and uh, at the end you have the, the planning of the conference with all the sessions. So we have plenary session and a parallel session in uh, this room, in Galusac Amphitrium, and also in Becquerel Amphitrium, which is uh, the, the amphitrium in the front of this one. So today we will have an opening uh, a a keynote uh, speaker with uh, Mrs. Marcoli, and uh, we will have also a plenary session uh, this afternoon about uh, topological form and information shared by uh, Daniel Benquin, and the short course uh, shared by Roger Ballion and given by uh, Dominic Spainer. And we will uh, conclude with a cocktail that will be in the lounge of uh, Ecole Polytechnique. And so, uh, for people who have a, a dinner uh, ticket, we have the, the dinner at uh, Versailles Garden in, uh, tomorrow. Uh, we will have two uh, openings, uh, uh, keynote speakers, so uh, Mr. Uh, Arnaudon tomorrow, and Mr. Ratiu uh, Friday. And we will uh, conclude the conference with uh, the invited talk of Professor Charles Michel Marle. So you have in your sacoche also the proceedings of the conference, which has been uh, edited by Springer. So many thanks to uh, Frank Nielsen, who worked very hard because you sent him many, uh, many formats uh, and you have to, 
to 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 make a, a good job on uh, to to have a very uh, beautiful uh, proceeding for this conference. So thank you, uh, Frank, for this uh, very good job. We will also, uh, after the conference, we will uh, motivate speakers, uh, contact speakers for long uh, papers in a special issue with the Entropy uh, Journal about differential geometrical theory of statistics. And uh, this special issue could be also edited in a book by uh, MDPI. They have already uh, edited a book uh, based on the SEE conference last year. Uh, so many thanks to uh, Lix department, uh, which is the department of uh, Frank Nielsen, and also many thanks to Ecole Polytechnique. So if you are not familiar with Ecole Polytechnique, so it has a long history of 220 years, uh, and uh, with many uh, very well-known students like uh, Henri Poincaré, or many ver very well-known uh, teachers like uh, Cauchy, Monge, Fourier. Uh, one word about the campus, uh, you are at the heart of the new uh, Paris-Saclay uh, University, which is a cluster of different high engineering schools on uh, uh, university, which has been ranked at the, uh, at the top eight world innovation hub by uh, MIT. Uh, so you are uh, at Ecole Polytechnique on the right, and you have a very large campus with different high engineering schools. Uh, about geometric uh, science of information, so it's like uh, a new grammar of information and we would like to make interrelationship between different domains from uh, probability and statistics, uh, Lie group geometry and topology, information theory, but also this year uh, we talk about uh, geometric mechanics, so we would like to develop some uh, relationship with uh, experts from uh, geometric mechanics, but also from uh, uh, statistical physics on, uh, on quantum physics. So two leitmotiv, uh, group everywhere and uh, metric uh, everywhere. So for group everywhere, I take this uh, citation. This is a report of Henri Poincaré on, on the work of Elie Cartan, and he says that Group theory is, so to speak, the whole mathematics stripped of its material and reduced to pure form. And the second leitmotiv is metric geometry. So uh, with, uh, this is a, a paper, a seminal paper of uh, Maurice Frechet, where he introduced abstract space and metric space. And uh, so there is many development in GSI community about metric space. On, uh, Last year at SEE conference, Max Ent, we have invited uh, Misha Gromov to give a talk on... Uh so this year, we have focused the, the conference on uh, geometric mechanics, uh, which is uh, at cornerstone of uh, geometric science of information. So uh, Professor Mao or Professor uh, uh, Ratiou and also Marc Arnaudon will give you some... Uh, some tutorial on uh, geometric mechanics. And just to give you uh, an anecdote, is that uh, Elie Cartan was the son of uh, Joseph Cartan, who was a village blacksmith. So you can imagine the little child, uh, Elie Cartan, looking at his father, Joseph, coding curvature on metal between the hammer and the anvil. So you have a like here you have the library of curvature and here you have the, uh, the coder of the curvature. So perhaps it gives him the idea of uh, holonomy on all his work on geometry. So the leitmotiv is also uh, not to be homo sapiens but to me homo faber. And see the citation of Bergson. Intelligence is a faculty of manufacturing artificial objects, especially tools to make tools, and of indefinitive trying the manufacturer. So our, uh, our symbol this year will be, uh, will be a, a forge. Uh, so this is a, a, a painting of uh, Lenin Brothers on uh, Velasquez on, uh, on uh, forge of Vulcan. 
So the sample of this year could be a, a, big, a big horn, so uh, you have a different hammer, so one of them is big horn. And we have a good transition from big horn to big horn. So, <laughs> not very funny, but uh, personal joke. And also some topic about geometric thermodynamics. I, I, I like a, a, a word, a, a sentence of uh, Vladimir Arnold. He says that he never understand thermodynamics, so he tried to introduce uh, contact uh, geometry for uh, thermodynamics. So we will have a session on geometric thermodynamics. And so to conclude, so uh, some of them have a, a ticket for the dinner at uh, Versailles. So it's also to enjoy geometry. It's not the same geometry. It's uh, the geometry of the gardens. Of, so the geometer of the Versailles gardens was uh, André Le Nôtre. And it was uh, the apex of what we call the Le Jardin à la Française. And also we make a, a link on a social event at Versailles because this year, this is a 300 years birthday of uh, the death of Louis uh, XIV. And Louis XIV has also uh, has established the uh, French Academy of Science. Uh, so the initial name was the Royal Academy of Science in uh, uh, 1666. So now I will give the, the microphone to Daniel that will introduce you the first uh, keynote speaker. Thank you, Frédéric. So uh, it's a great pleasure here to welcome uh, Mathilde Marcoli here. Yeah. Uh, as you see uh, on uh, our uh, emblem, uh, it was a woman who teach uh, geometry uh, in this uh, picture, okay. so it's uh, natural to begin uh, by uh, uh, a woman doing geometry, and I hope you will be happier than the people we heard uh, on the picture. Okay. And uh, Mathilde is a um, professor uh, of mathematics in uh, Caltech, okay. and uh, she was uh, mainly uh, interested with uh, many, many subjects okay, of uh, geometry, algebra, and physics. Okay and especially uh, interaction between uh, um, <coughs> algebraic geometry and quantum field uh, theory. Okay. But she has a much larger spectrum. Okay. For example, I must confess, she also published, uh, write and published poetry okay, and a uh, book on art. Okay. And uh, his widest uh, interest okay, uh, made that is natural in some sense. She also in interested by human sciences. Okay and which is a vocation of uh, information theory too. And she will uh, present us a yeah, recent uh, work, yeah, uh, <coughs> applying or uh, looking for application uh, of uh, geometry, algebra, yeah, and especially uh, statistical structures she invented yeah, to uh, computational uh, linguistics. Okay. So the title is uh, geometry, From Geometry and Physics to Computational uh, Linguistics. Okay. So perhaps I go back and I come uh, uh, after for the question. So you have uh, one hour, you perhaps included question. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for you know, inviting me to speak at this conference. You know, I'm, as you know, Danielle was saying, been mostly working somehow at the interface between mathematics and theoretical physics, geometry and theoretical physics. And um, so recently I also did a little bit of work in the direction of things related to information theory, which I'll talk about this afternoon in the section that Daniel is and Vera are running. But uh, what I'm talking about in this talk is a topic that's a little bit different and you know, it has to do with somehow trying to use ideas from geometry, topology and physics to think about a completely different subject which is linguistics. This is something that I've actually been playing with a little bit in the last few months you know, with a group of students at Caltech and um, 
we've been trying to see with a bunch of you know, experiments, you know, uh, computational experiments that I'll talk about in a moment, whether you know, one can use methods, uh, more geometric or topological methods, to think about the structure of language. So, I mean, I'm sure probably most of you are more you know, familiar with the geometry side than with the linguistic side, so I'm going to you know, go very quickly through what I mean by linguistics and what kind of problems one is interested in. And, uh, you know, setting. So linguistics is by definition the study of language and what I mean by language is really natural languages, not you no know, artificial languages like programming languages, formal languages and so on. Uh, it's really you know, the, the human natural you know, languages that you see around the world. And the, the point of view, of, which is a general point of view of modern linguistics, is that language is some kind of structure and one wants to understand what kind of structure it is. And that's you know, the, the origin of the idea that the subject may be, it may be possible to approach the subject mathematically, because after all, mathematics is, in a sense, about the understanding of structures. And so the, the kind of questions that typically people ask about languages, is you know, how, how are different languages related? You know, we all know that they come in families, and that the, the, we also know that languages evolve in time. You know, ancient languages that you know, gave rise to modern languages, and the languages are kind of a dynamical entities. And also, you know, you know that people acquire languages and they, their children, they learn how to speak and you know, it, we all know that it's much easier to acquire a language in that way than when you try to do it as an adult. So there are kind of neuroscience related questions on what is the process of language acquisition, how that works, and how the structural language is stored in the human brain. And you know, there's a, in a sense an, an aspect that you know, I'll, we come back to in some way is the fact that if one looks at what has been happening in modern linguistics, one finds a kind of dichotomy between a discrete and a continuum approach. A discrete approach is to think of language as some kind of algebraic structures, and uh, the continuum approach is the, the, the idea of, of the fact that these algebraic structures support some kind of probabilistic structures, which is what is, after all, at the basis of all the, the mainstream sort of computational linguistics that has to do with machine translations and you know, uh, natural language processing and, and so on. And finally, you know, you, as in, in all this, the sciences that have to do with um, human phenomena, language, there's a, there's a problem that you want to model it in a way that's not just descriptive, but that it should be predictive in some way. So that's, that's why also one wants to have mathematical models. So another thing about language is that you know, languages are things that you can look at at many different levels of structure. And if, according to what level of structure you, you're looking at, you, might, you would expect to find different kind of models. And you know, it, I, I have this, since, since I'm, you know, I, I'm originally a physicist, I have this analogy in mind that if you would look at the world at different scales, you have different kind of physics that you encounter. And you know, as you move the scale, you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this old beautiful little movie that's called Powers of Ten, where you, know, you, you zoom in and out by changing the scale by a factor of 10 each time, and you see that the world looks very different as, as you change the scale. And so they, something similar is happening with languages. There are basically at least four different levels of, uh, of you know, scale at which you can think about languages. The, the finest scale is when you look at languages at the level of the, of the sounds, the basic sounds and how they are combined. That's the phonology level. And, but you can go further out in, in, the, in, your, in, your, in, in the scale at which you look at languages and think that the basic unit now is the word, not the, the composing sound of the word. And then you're at the level of morphology where you study how words are modified 
by grammar. And there's a, there's a further larger scale, which is syntax, where the, the unit of measure is not a word, but the sentence. And so, so syntax is the structure of sentences in a language. And then there's, a, there's all like a further out, uh, you know, larger scale, which is that of meaning, which is the semantic scale. So, and you, exp as I said, you, according to the, the level at which you want to look at languages, you're going to have to deal with different models. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, stick to one level, and I will focus only on the level of syntax. So syntax is how sentences are produced and how, how they are structured. So when linguists think about syntax, the picture they have in mind is sort of like these colder sculptures. <laughs> So the <laughs> you think of sentences as a, as a kind of tree structures that's hanging somewhere, and the place where it's hanging is the old sentence, and the, the sub-trees are the, the, the substructures that a sentence is built out of. And the, what distinguishes different languages is the way these trees are structured. So, you know, in, for example, you can see that the tree, the, the the part of that tree on the right and the part of that tree on the left have a different way in which the subtrees are nested. And that would you know, correspond, as I'm going to say in a moment, to a language that's had final, like Japanese. Or the, that part would correspond to a language that's had initial, like English. And so there are certain properties of a language that you can flip around and change and switch from the way a certain language works to a way another language works. And that, that's one of the key ideas of modern linguistics, that there's some kind of uh, you know, uh, st structure that's uh, detected by this kind of parameter. So like, the basic tenet of modern syntactic theory is that so what syntax does for you is to test grammaticality. So you produce a sentence you know, given a certain lexicon, and then you want to know if that sentence is grammatical or not. And whether, so there, there's a, it is, is that you have a, a gen, the idea of generative grammar is that you have a mechanism that produces sentences given a certain lexicon, and you have a mechanism that cuts off all the ones that are not you know, grammatical according to the way that language is structured. And you know, they, there's, a, there's a kind of a, somewhat more metaphysical idea in, in modern linguistics, which is the idea of a universal grammar, which is the fact that you know, the, there's somewhere, well, it's, a, it's somewhat controversial because you know, one doesn't really have evidence from the neuroscience perspective that the universal grammar really sits in our brain. But the idea would be that all these uh, settings that decide whether a language works a certain way or another way are somehow uh, recorded in some way in our brain during the process of language acquisition. And once they are set, we are, you know, form sentences according to that rule rather than another rule. Of course, there's a question behind this idea whether this universal grammar idea that goes back to Chomsky is a falsifiable theory or not in the scientific sense. And you know, there's, there's some debate about that in the linguistic community. But you know, I just want to take this point of view which is called principles and parameters in, the, in, in uh, modern linguistics, which is one tries to code the syntactic structures of different languages in a string of binary variables. And each of these binary variables is what they call a parameter in linguistics. It's like an on and off switch, which tells you whether the language you're thinking about you know, admits a certain kind of construction of sentence or, or it doesn't. For example, as I said, head directionality is uh, the one that I already mentioned. And uh, you know, the, for, for example, you, know, you have certain languages would put the, the, always the subject before the verb. Other languages would always put it after the verb. And each of these, in some languages, might allow you to do both. So each of these is a, is a zero one choice. You either can do it or you cannot do it. And you, so if, if once you list all these possibilities, you get a string of binary numbers, which are the corresponding parameters. And 
and you see the way these parameters are set, you know, determining the kind of structure that these subtrees of a sentence can have in, in uh, how well-formed sentences in that language. So there are cases, as I said, where a language has both possibilities, but you know, one of them with a, with a higher frequency than another one. So there's a, there's a certain sense in which we now think that you should consider these parameters not as completely deterministic variables, but with a kind of probability attached to them that has, you know, a, that correspond to the frequency with which that parameter falls. But I, I will, you know, for the purpose of this talk, you know, really think of parameters as being just binary variables. In a sense. So, you know, typically parameters detect word order in sentences and other or other properties like. Uh, you know, the, whether, I'll make an example in a moment, what pro drop means, whether you can drop the subject in a sentence or not, and you can drop the pronoun, and so on. And so there are problems related to this parameter model of syntax. And two of the main questions are, the first one is what are the relations? So one can list a lot of these parameters. One can list some hundreds of parameters for, and actually linguists have recorded a lot of these parameters for a lot of world languages. There are very nice databases that I'll mention later, which is what we use for these, uh, these computational experiments. And um, <clears throat> so there are lots of these parameters, but one problem is that it's, it's unclear what are the relations between them. So it's known that certain parameters when they are set in a certain way, will force other parameters to be set also in a certain way. So they're not all completely independent variables. However, it's not clear really what are all the dependencies. So what, what is a set of, in, a, a minimal set of independent variables that you can use? And uh, another kind of problem, or question is that uh, it's known that parameters evolve in time when, as languages evolve. And so what is the dynamics that governs this change in, uh, of, of parameters? So the, what I mean by these dependencies, let me make a simple example. So two of these parameters, for example, are called null subject and pro drop. Null subject just means that you can drop the subject of a certain sentence in, in certain cases. And for example, no, all the, well, if you take languages like Spanish, Italian, and French, they're very similar languages, but for example, Spanish and Italian have no subject, but French does not. And that's one of the very few parameters in which these languages differ. Mostly they are, for the purpose of syntax, they're mostly the same language, but they, they, they differ by just some more small differences, and this is one of them. Uh, Prodrop is something slightly more general, which tells you that you can drop pronouns in, in arbitrary sentences, not just you know, drop the subject and sentences like that. For example, Mandarin has, uh, has a prodrop. If I say, I don't know, I, but literally I'm saying, don't know, like it. When I said, I don't know, do you like it? But I, I can drop all the, all the pronouns and it's still grammatically correct. Of course, it wouldn't be in English if I drop all the pronouns. Now, pro drop controls null subject because it's a stronger property. So that's a dependency between parameters. This is an easy one because you can see it, but there are lots of dependencies that are not so easy and are not, not so well understood. So, you know, how many independent parameters are there? And is there some interesting geometry in this space of parameters of languages? So, how, so you no, know, the way we try to approach this question is, first of all, get as much information as we can possibly get about these parameters. As I said, there are very nice databases that are available now online, where linguists very patiently you know, recorded syntactic parameter for a lot of world languages. So a lot, of course, means that you know, there, there's, there's many world languages that are you know, spoken by very small populations in, uh, in difficult conditions. <laughs> so not all the world languages are mapped you know, in these databases, and not, not all of them are mapped completely. Well, typically they have is some hundred of languages, which is quite a, quite a few, but I mean, there are thousands of languages in the world, so it's, it's not a complete list. 
and they have about 150 parameters recorded for these, these languages. But it's already you know, a good enough uh, database that you can try to see whether there's some structure into them. So the first kind of structure that we look for is topological structure. So what I mean by that, there's an idea of, uh, which is quite popular these days, of using topology to study structure in data sets. So you have some kind of data and you, which you, know, you can plot in some way, you know, in, your, in some usually very high dimensional space. And you try to see ways in which this data cluster together. And of course the simplest kind of uh, idea is to find clusters, so like connected components where the, around which the data you know, group the data together in, in different components. But you can do something more than that. That would be like the, the, the zero homology. It just counts connected components. But you can also see whether the data cluster around some shapes, which would give you some kind of higher dimensional homology. So more precisely, what you do is this. You have your set of uh, points in some Euclidean space and you use the, you, the, the standard Euclidean distance, and you construct a, a simplicial complex where you just look at the n tuples of points where all the pairs have a certain bound on the distance. So you get a, a, a family of simplicial complexes that depend on a parameter, which is your distance parameter. So it's the scale at which you're looking at this, uh, at this data. And you can, of course, when you change the scale, you have inclusions between these simplicial complexes. So you have induced map on, on homology. You, you, when you compute the homology of this kind of complexes, you see that typically you find, well, I mean, if you look at what happens with the, with the H0, it's clear. Like when you look at a very small scale, you, you pretty much have all the points, if the scale is sufficiently small, each point counts as a connected component. So you have lots of connected components. As the scale grows, a lot of points get grouped in the same component, and so you have uh, you know, fewer and fewer components. And so you, you have, at the beginning, you see a lot of generators of H0 that tend to disappear after a while. And uh, it, the same thing typically happens with the higher dimensional things, so you, you see certain kind of you know, generators that persist for a while and then disappear, or appear and persist for a while and disappear. So the, this one typically represents the picture in this kind of barcode graphs where you see the generators appear and disappear, and you have these births and deaths of uh, persistent generators. And the idea is that the longer a certain generator persists, the more it's really telling you a feature of the data and not just a, 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 an accident. Uh, for example, if I go back to see this picture, you can see that you know, if you look at a sufficiently small scale, all these, you would see a lot of circles. But if you look at a larger scale, you would see only one circle. And that one circle will persist longer than the, the, the small circles. So in, in a sense, that's, that's a more, uh, you know, it's a more interesting feature of the data rather than small circles. So the, the idea is that you look for generators that we call persistent generators that remain uh, there for, for a, a sufficiently large interval of scales. Okay, so you know, we tried this analysis on, the, on these languages. We took a, a sample of 250, about 250 languages and more than 100 parameters. And the thing is, you know, the, if you try to put all the world languages together, you get a lot of noise, but because you know, the parameters of different languages can be very, very different. But if you start to look at language families in, in, in the linguistic sense, and you anal analyze the persistent topology by language families, then you start to see some interesting phenomena. So in particular, what comes out is two type of phenomena. There's persistent H0, which is like connected components, and there's persistent H1. So persistent H0 is not difficult to understand because it really does correspond to major language subfamilies within the same family. And uh, so it tells you something about 
historical linguistics, the fact that certain families are branched out very early into subfamilies that remain separate and they sort of evolve their different ways. And this, this is, uh, is you know, detectable by the topology. Persistent H1 is more mysterious and I'll, I'll you know, say something more about it in a moment. So persistent H1 can occur you can think of it as being originating by two possible different phenomena. One is sort of the Hoff bifurcation type phenomenon. Or you see something that is just a connecting component and at some point it, it you know, generates a circle. And another is like a, a, a path that closes up into a circle. <clears throat> and these correspond to different phenomena from if, if your, your direction is, is time and you're looking at the evolution of languages, this would correspond to different phenomena from the linguistic point of view. So let's look at a concrete example. So the, the Indo-European language family is one of the most widely studied because you know, there are ancient texts and one can reconstruct, one knows a lot about the ancient languages as well as the modern ones. So it's one of those that are you know, best understood. So if one runs this topological analysis only looking at the Indo-European languages, one finds this interesting story. There's two generators of H0. And I said, that's not surprising because when you look at what they are, well, they are, it's called Indo-European for a good reason, because there's the Indo-Iranic subfamily and the European subfamily, and they branched out very early in, in the history of the Indo-European civilization, and these, these two are the two components of the H0. Okay, <laughs> not surprising. There's, there's one generator of H1, now that is more mysterious. What is this circle in the, in the family of the Indo-European languages? Where, where is it coming from? Well, let's look at other language families. So the Niger-Congo languages, that, that's the, the, biggest, the biggest language family in the world. Not by number of speakers, but by number of languages in the family. And so it's an interesting one to look at. And this one has three persistent component of H0 and no persistent H1. So this H1 is a, is a curious phenomenon that occurs in the Indo-European language. It's something to do with the history of the Indo-European languages that doesn't occur in, the, in other language families. The three H0, again, is just the fact that the Niger-Congo languages is subdivided into three major language families. And the three H0 components are the three major language families. That, that's, in, you know, historical linguistic term, H0 is clear. But so what, what was this H1 of the, of the Indo-European languages that you don't see in other language families? Well, you know, most, a lot of people here are probably French, so you should all have a natural guess and say, yes, it's the Anglo-Norman bridge. Because, you know, the, as we all know, modern English you know, derived from ancient, ancient you know, English, old English, as much as it derives from French. So the tree of the, the phylogenetic tree of the Indo-European languages is not a tree, but uh, it has a loop. And say, so, okay, that loop must be the same loop, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> something should make you suspicious of this uh, proposal of the explanation. What should make you suspicious is the fact that you know, the, the Anglo-Norman bridge is mostly a lexical phenomenon. It's not a syntactic phenomenon. I mean, I, look, the language has, has different levels of structure. And what, what happened there in that historical you know, phenomenon, what happened is that the, the, the lexicon, the vocabulary of English got a lot of influx from French, but the syntax of English was not so much affected. So, you know, it's, uh, this, this is the natural guess, but you know, it turns out that it's not the right answer. How do you check it's not the right answer? Well, you run the same topological analysis by only looking at the, the group of the Germanic and Latin languages, which is where this loop should be, where it, where it is in the phylogenetic tree, and you expect, if, if it's that, you would see the, 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 the H1 generator appearing here, but the H1 generator does not appear, well, you have two components which are 
the Latin and the Germanic, <laughs> which you know, is, is so syntactically that, that these two subfamilies remain separate, even though lexically they were joined. So, okay, what is it then? <laughs> what is this loop? Well, you no, know, if if some of you have had the same kind of uh, no, classical education that I had with all the ancient languages and so on, you know that there's always one explanation for everything. It's always because of the ancient Greeks. <laughs> so, yet again, it is because of the ancient Greeks. So, if you, uh, so ancient Greeks sits in a very strange position in the, in the tree of Indo-European languages. Because nothing's, it's, it's an isolated branch. Nothing comes out of it except modern Greek. However, you know, it influenced a lot of the European languages, not just at the lexical, but also at the syntactic level. And so you, if you run again the topological analysis, but this time, well, you remove the, the Indo-Iranic component because it's not there that the circle is contained. It's contained in the European component, in the European Connecticut component. <laughs> but, and you also remove the Greek, you know, ancient modern Greek, that, that, that little branch of the tree. Then what you're left with now is very interesting. The circle has disappeared. So Greek was responsible for that circle. It has, it has gone. And the rest now has three connected components, rather, it, it, rather than one. So they, it, the, the, the European part of the Indo-European family should have one H0 and one H1. Now, after you remove Greek, you're left with three H0 and uh, no H1. So the picture, you know, it was it's kind of like you had a circle and some kind of other and coming out, and, and Greek sits at that vertex, and when you remove it, you get you know, three Three component. It's, uh, yeah. So that's something that, okay, so what, what is the point uh, that I'm trying to make? Is that you can see things that uh, are, have to do with historical linguistics in a way that you wouldn't see just by thinking about historical linguistics. It, it's, uh, it's, in, in, it's seen by the topology of the, of the space of syntax, of syntactic parameters of languages. Okay, well, what else? Um, so, as I said, you know, param syntactic parameters should be thought of as variables that change in time in the evolution of languages. So let, let's think about, for example, parameters that have to do with word order. And word order in particular, the relative position of subject, verb, and object in sentences. So there are, here are all, all the possible combinations of orders. And all of them exist in world languages, but with very different distribution. Most of the world languages fit into the first two categories. And the, the last two categories are extremely rare. It's very, very difficult to find any language that, that organizes their sentences in that way. They exist, though. I mean, it's, uh, they are, there are examples, but they're very, very rare. And so, actually, there, there's some ambiguity in how one writes parameters. One can think of these as a single parameter, but one can also think of it as a product of two different parameters. So, you know, so sometimes these things are, if you look at the literature, they are, some prefer one, one way or another. Okay, so, there, so there, there are these facts. So, first of all, these parameters are distributed very unevenly across world languages. And also, they are known to change in time. So, for example, you know, the, um, this order, order of subject, verb, and object, it's known that ancient Greek switched you know, over time. So, they, okay, let, let, let me make a, a first, a first uh, comment before, before this, uh, this evolutionary one. So, the first comment is that you know, the, the relative prevalence, so the fact that some, some of these configurations are a lot more prevalent in world languages than other. No, there, there are two possible explanations for that. One is sort of trying to look for a neuroscience explanation so that you know, some of these combinations are, you know, fit better in the, in the Broca area of the, of the human brain than other, and so that's why they are so frequent as opposed to other. And other explanations are internal, so you know, it have to do with the way the languages evolve in time, that they, you know, some are you know, 
end up being attractor points and other end up not being. So both explanations, and we don't know what, what is the best, but you no, know, people do look for either type of explanation. And as I said, you know, this parameter change in time. So ancient Greek switched from SOV to SVO in the, in the period in between Homeric Greek and Classical Greek. Sanskrit switched twice because of influence of the Dravidian languages. So Sanskrit is an Indo-European language, but it's bordering with the, with the geographic area of the Dravidian languages that have it the other way. And so you know, in the influence of you know, a group of languages on another language ends up flipping one of the parameters. And historically, there are recorded examples how these parameters have been flipping back and forth depending on the interaction between languages that belong to different linguistic groups. Well, English also switched between Old English and Middle English from b between two different forms. So now, the, the, how does one try to model this kind of evolution of parameters? Well, you know, there's a thing I said here, if you are a physicist, there's, there, you, there's something, you know, it's like one of those Pavlovian uh, reflexes that you cannot avoid. If somebody says, you know, you have two binary variables that influence each other and they tend to align, you think, spin glass. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing that will prevent you from <laughs> doing that, right? So see, as a physicist, you think this is a spin glass model. And so let's say, okay, let's, let's try to, to see, you know, how much one can fit this idea into a, 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 the formalism of, of spin glass models. So we have this bunch of binary variables. We think of each of these as a spin, which is either up or down. So uh, each language is a, is a vertex of your graph over which this spin model is happening. And at each vertex, you have not just one spin, but a, a, a family with all the, the parameters. And the, the, as we've seen historically, you know, dynamics of, that tends to modify these parameters often happen because of interactions with near, nearby languages. So you want to model somehow the, the, the strength of the interaction. So there's an interaction like in spin models that tend to align the spins. And what, what is it that measures the strength of the interaction? Well, in a sense, it's the proportion of bilingualism. You know, the more that I speak two languages, the more this tends to modify the languages. And so what, what we did is trying to you know, come up with good data that mo model this. And let's say in a moment we got them from MIT's Media Lab, in a moment what they use. And um, so there's another thing that you want to try to in, you know, fit into this model. You know, the, the dynamics in spin glass models you know, it depends on the temperature parameter which in a sense tells you how, how strong the, the interaction, I mean, or, or how much the, 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 the higher le energy levels are activated you know, in the dynamics. And what is this temperature parameter? Well, one way to think of it is that, as I said, you know, the, these parameters in, in linguistics are not really frozen. You know, they, they, there, are, there are really uh, often possibilities of having, you know, the two states, but with, diff with a certain probability attached to it. And so that, that is exactly what the, the temperature parameter does in the spin glass models. They tell you that the spins are not frozen, that they have a certain probability of being one way or, or another. So you know, one can think of the temperature parameters, how much you want to you know, think of these spins as being fluctuating rather than being, being frozen. However, you know, there's one thing that you need to do, which is the fact uh, that there are these relations between parameters, like the one I, I mentioned before. Some parameters dominate other parameters. So they're not just, so if this were all independent variables, we would just have you know, a bunch of uncorrelated you know, easing models attached to the same graph, and they would all be devolved independently. But, uh, it, but they're not, because you know, parameters you know, are not all independent variables. Okay. So, okay, Let, so basically what we do is, okay, the, the general setting is this, you have, you have a graph, you have configurations of spins over each vertex, and you, know, the, you think of the, the Hamiltonian as being the usual way, you have uh, you know, the in interaction terms that tend to align the spins, and you have a kind of, a, you know, uh, you know, additional term in using models that tells you 
you know, whether you have an external magnetic field that tends to align the, the um, spins with, with this field. And what I, the reason why I'm considering this model is because I'm going to use a modification of that term to uh, model the, the relations between paramet different parameters. So it will be something that the Hamiltonian I'm going to consider will be something that when you freeze one of the parameters, it will look like this, uh, this external. So a frozen parameter will act like an external magnetic field on the other parameters. And if it's not frozen, then it will become an interaction term. Okay, and you know, what one normally does, you know, there's a partition function, a certain this determines a Gibbs measure on, the, on all the, the configurations of the system that weights the, the states, you know, by you know, the ground state is the dominant one and the higher temperature states are you know, weight depending on these, the temperature parameter. <clears throat> At high temperature, they, they contribute more. At low temperature, the, the ground state is the dominant one. And the, the typical picture in the usual using model is that there's a critical temperature with a phase transition. Above the critical temperature, there's, a, there's zero magnetization, so the spins are distributed randomly. And uh, below the critical temperature, you have this spontaneous magnetization where all the spins align in, in one direction. So, okay, so we, what, what we're gonna do is, you know, think of a, a graph where all the vertices are the different languages that you can consider, and you have an edge you know, whenever two languages interact in the sense that there's, there's some, you know, uh, known, some amount of bilingualism measured in some way. And uh, so you have, a, you have either, you know, you put a zero one or, or plus, plus minus one value for these, uh, these parameters, or you allow the possibility of having three values where the zero value is just where the parameter is not defined at all. So the reason for that is that the, there are situations where you have two parameters that are dependent on one another, this what linguists call entail, entailment relations, where if one of the parameters is set one way, the other one can be up or down without problem, but if the first parameter is set the other way, then the second parameter is simply not defined. So it has this zero value. So when you have a coupling of parameters in a sense, you are trying to couple a, a, a easing model with two states, which is the dominant parameter, and the pot model with three states, which is the, the other dependent parameter of the internment relation. And so the way we model the interaction strength so the, the, the MIT Media Lab had constructed, they call this global language network, where they uh, try to evaluate the amount of bilingualism, and they did it in two ways. So one is to count the number of uh, book translations between two languages, and the other is to count the amount of uh, Wikipedia edits. What they mean by that is whether the same editor is likely to edit in two different languages. As a, as a measure of bilingualism. And we, we try to use both, both things and the, the results are kind of uh, you know, the same, so they, they are pretty consistent. So this gives you, you know, the strength of the, of the interactions between this, this graph. And so the, uh, <clears throat> so, Okay, let, let's first do like a, a, a simply simplified model where you first think of the parameters just being independent. And so if, if you think of them as just being independent, then you, know, you just run the usual uh, metropolis casting algorithm for uh, the, to, to find the equilibrium configuration of the dynamics. So you, know, you uh, <coughs> do a, a, like a, it, it's really like a, a steepest descent method to get to the, um, oops, sorry. Okay, so let, let's just take an example. If you just take one parameter, example, the subject verb parameter, which means you know, your language allows subject before verb. And the, the point is that if you look at the, most languages have this parameter up. So most languages allow that. The only one in the database we use, the only ones that, that have it the other way are the ones that have to do with, with the Irish, Welsh, Gaelic. It's that group of languages that don't allow subject before the verb. 
So it's in, in a case like this, if this parameter is completely independent than anything else, it's clear that you know, if you are in the, in the sort of low temperature regime, the fact that most parameters are up will tend eventually to pull the other ones up. However, if you are in a, in a high temperature situation, you can get configurations where you have a much more mixed you know, uh, equilibrium position of, of parameters. And if you, however, also <coughs> encode the relations between parameters, so I, I just took a simple example, a very small group of languages that have a, an interesting configuration of parameters. So these you know, strong dexes and strong anaphoricity have to do with how pronouns, pronouns are used in, uh, in sentences. And strong dexes is something that allows you to, like for example, if I say, I don't know, <coughs> you, you like reading. And I said, reading, that's what you like. I, you know, I'm making that kind of emphasis on the subject. Some languages have this kind of constructions and some don't. That's called the strong dexes. Anaphoricity is when you know, a pronoun refers to something back in another part of the sentence and whether that same kind of structure carries over to anaphoricity from the principal part depends on the language. So, but the, the, the first parameter dominates the second. So it, it, the, what happens is that if the first parameter is up, the second parameter can be either way, <clears throat> and there are examples where it's one way or the other. For example, Russian has it up, up, and Bulgarian, which is a very similar language, has it up, down. <coughs> but if the first parameter is down, the second parameter is just not defined. It doesn't even make sense to define it, so that's the, the minus one, zero, like Welsh has it. So if you, let, let's just take a simple example, very small graph with this initial configuration of parameters. And now with a Hamiltonian that has this coupling of the, of the parameter that uh, favors this kind of configuration <clears throat> where one of the position forces the other one to be either way. And so you know, if you, now they're not independent variables, so if you run the dynamics now with this kind of Hamiltonian that also has the interaction between the entailment relation between the parameters, and there's like an energy scale that tells you how strong that entailment relation is, you still think of it as a, in a kind of probabilistic sense, you know, it's, uh, it's very likely that it's enforced or, or it's not, depending on this energy scale. And you, know, you run again this kind of uh, metropolis Asting algorithm, and you find that you get different equilibrium configurations according to, now you have two parameters, the temperature parameter and the strength of the this entailment relation. The, so high temperature, high energy, high temperature, low energy, low temperature, high energy, and low temperature, low energy, you find very different equilibrium configurations for the, this, this set of parameters. <clears throat> so this, this is the kind of, you know, picture that you get for, for the, the, the average magnetization in, in this case. <clears throat> so the, of course, this is like a, a toy model example because I took a very small group of languages and one would have to you know, scale it up to, to a much larger to have a realistic picture because these languages do not just interact with each other, they interact with all the other languages. So that's, but this is the kind of idea about how one can you know, try to model you know, how syntactic parameter change by effect of interaction between languages. So um, another thing that I want to mention briefly has to do with this different distribution of uh, linguistic parameters. As I said some, some parameters are very frequent among languages, are very frequently ac activated or up you know, position among languages and other are very rare. And uh, <coughs> This also you know, relates to, so we're, we're trying to see you know, how prevalence, cross-linguistic prevalence of parameters is related to possible interactions between parameters. So what, the way we approach this question you know, is by, again, using the same databases of parameters and using models of sparse distributed memories. So Canerva networks are a way to model human memory as a way to model associative memories in my mind. And it was you know, introduced in the 80s, a model for possibly artificial intelligence. Or, and basically what you do is you have a, some large space, you know, some large you know, vector space over F2. And 
you have a sample of locations in this, uh, in this large space, which should be sparse. So it's important they are that you know, k is, two to the k is significantly smaller than the dimension of the space. And you um, look at the, the Hamming spheres of a certain radius around all these, uh, these locations, this hard location. And you have a writing and reading to memory mechanism. So given as a datum, which is a vector in your ambient space, each of the hard location gets its coordinate incremented depending on the, the entry, the corresponding entry of your, your storing datum. And when you read at a certain location, you read by the majority rule of all the locations in its access sphere. So it's, uh, you know, the point is that if these are sufficiently sparse, then you know, there's, there's not many you know, overlaps between the spheres, so you get a pre fairly precise reconstruction of the datum. So the point is that Canerva networks are good at reconstructing corrupted data. If you have a, a small amount of your data that gets corrupted, you know, they, they are stored in, uh, sufficiently well in the network that you can reconstruct the corrupted part from the remaining part of the data. And for this reason, it's also good to detect dependencies among sets of data because you can see that certain parts of the data can be better reconstructed from the rest. And that si uh, is a signal of the fact that it may be some kind of dependence between the rest of the variables and the one that you're constructing. So what we did is just put all this data of uh, syntactic parameters of languages in a Carnarva network. And we did it for a sample of just 21 parameters right, for 165 languages. And then you, know, you just corrupt one parameter at a time, and you check how well the Canerva network reconstructs that parameter from the remaining ones. And you know, what happens is that you find two phenomena. So this is actually the specific syntactic parameters that we used and the, the, the corresponding frequencies in the group of languages that we considered. And uh, you find two kinds of phenomena. One that has to do with the frequency, so the, the prevalence of a parameter among languages, and another which is independent of that, and it's really some kind of syntactic relation, abstract syntactic relation between parameters. So here is what we find as the corruption feature. So the, <clears throat> the lowest ones are the ones that are best reconstructable from the, the remaining the remaining parameters, and the, the ones that are up above are the ones that are more difficult to reconstruct. And these are the, the relative, the, the prevalence of the parameters among languages. So the ones that are rarest or most prevalent tend to be the ones that are best reconstructable, but not, not quite. So the point is, if you take random data that have the same frequencies, you find a curve that goes somewhat like this. So it's, uh, <clears throat> the, there's an effect which is just, has to do with a correlation between prevalence and recoverability, but there's a, an additional effect. I mean, this curve is significantly different from this curve, although it has kind of the same shape. And these additional you know, effects are really just syntactic relations between parameters. So it detects the presence of an of a underlying relation between parameters. <clears throat> And so you find that certain, this is an example of the different degree of recoverability when it's normalized for, pre for prevalence. So it's the, the remaining effect, the one that is purely syntactical, of uh, some of these, these parameters. So you know, there, in a sense, what you can read of this, uh, these results is the fact that you know, some parameters you know, are, in a sense, dependent variables of the other parameters. But this is the kind of dependency that is not like an algebraic dependency, is more a, a, a statistical dependence. And uh, <clears throat> so it, these, these uh, results are you know, done by um, taking all the, la the, the languages that we consider are a cross section of all the linguistic families in the world. They don't belong to the same language family. So one can probably get uh, slightly more refined pictures by subdividing the data by linguistic families and looking at how these curves change within specific linguistic families. You know, the, the, some parameters may, may be more recoverable within certain families than others. So that you know, is something that we're still, we're still looking at. 
And one point thing that I'm going to mention is that since you know Kanarma networks are a good, good models for human memory, you know the the a possible way to to think about this this point of view is that uh, you want to <clears throat> try to, I mean, going back to the, this fact that people try to understand. Uh, cross-linguistic prevalence of parameters in terms of possible neuroscience models, you know, of how they, these parameters may be stored in the human brain. This might be a, a possible method to approach that question. I, I want to just mention very briefly something which is still in progress. You know, the, um, one of the questions that linguists have is phylogenetic linguistics. So try to reconstruct as accurately as possible the phylogenetic tree of a certain language family. This is very well done for very, 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 you know, well done by traditional linguistics for language families for which one has a lot of old texts, like the Indo-European language. Or, I mean, there are other examples. This is the, the Mayan you know, language family. It's another language for which there are lots of uh, documents that ex exist, existed for thousands of years and the people can read so that one can trace the evolution of the language through the evolution of the written text. But for most language families in the world, this is not possible because one only has the modern languages and there are no written documents that go back to ancient languages. So there's no way to just do these traditional methods of linguistics to trace the, the evolution of languages. So what you know, people try to do is some kind of computational methods to produce phylogenetic trees. And one method is lexical. So you have certain lists of uh, words the Swadesh lists, which are you know, words that uh, are likely to exist in all languages that have to do with certain actions, parts of the body, I mean, things that ev every language expresses in some way. And you try to find cognate words and measure the distance between them. There are problems with this approach because you know, languages have a lot of synonyms and you, know, you might have one that matches another language but another synonym would, would work better for another. So you know, there, there's a lot of ambiguity and there's a lot of false positives when you try to match by machine you know, the, these uh, languages. So you know, I, what I want to <clears throat> argue here, let me just quickly go, I mean, the, there's a standard technique for producing these uh, trees given a, a distance, a set of data, and a, a, you know, encoded data in the distance. But the, what I want to argue is that um, it is be better to use as the data the, um, yeah, it'd be better to use as the data the syntactic parameters rather than using the Swadesh list because the syntactic parameters are just binary variables that are intrinsic to the structure of the language. They don't depend on the choice of a particular synonym for a word in, in, a, in a set of many choices. And it, in fact, no, recently a group of linguists have already started to check whether using the syntactic parameters can generate better phylogenetic trees than using the lexical information. And uh, for the Indo-European family, that works very well. So the, it's very accurate the, compared to the, the tree that one knows from uh, traditional linguistic methods. And so you know, what we are presently doing is sort of trying to extend this to the rest of the database of syntactic parameters for other world language families and try to compare the, the phylogenetic trees that we get with this method with the ones that uh, linguists can get with the lexical method. So yeah, that's, I'll stop here. <laughs> that, Thank you very much for this uh, exposition of uh, your research. And uh, how was the question? Well, take time. No. Uh, what is the role of alphabet in this analysis? I didn't see any role of the number of the alphabets or the alphabets? Uh, well, so alpha, yeah, <laughs> no. So first you, of all. You mentioned that you are, uh, you are focusing on syntax. That's right. Analysis, 
no, also alphabet, you see, is something that has to do with the written language, right? So there are lots of al different alphabets in the world and so on, but, you know, most languages are not written, right? So if you take alphabet as a, as a point of view in language, you restrict your pool of languages a lot. And it's also, I mean, alphabets are kind of accidental, you know? Even you can have, you can see it when you have, you can have different phonemes that end up being written with the same letter. So there's a lot of ambiguity in alphabet. They're not, they're not a good, uh, a good way to think about languages, I mean, but primarily because they completely exclude languages that are not written. And you know, what linguists use is this phonetic, phonetic alphabet, right? There's a way of just classifying phonemes. So you can write words phonetically for any, any language. And that's more accurate because you know, it, it just records the actual phonemes and there's like a, you know, a periodic table of phonemes that you know, has, uh, uh, which it just depends on position of the tongue in the mouth. So it, that, that's pretty, you know, I mean, it has a basis in the, in the way the, the sounds can be produced. But otherwise, an alphabet is just a purely conventional set of symbols. And so it's not, uh, from the linguistic point of view, it's not use, useful really. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, in the, in the, uh, when you, you had different levels of H0, H1, and H2, and you talked about persistence uh, structure, uh, I didn't understand how did you define the number of the components in each category. You had blue and, uh, and black, and you... Right, so... For, you had, how, how did you... Yeah. What, what was the, the, the criterion to, to, to Yeah, so what to define happens is that you, uh, you, you have a set of data, and you construct this kind of simplicial complexes where you just look at, uh, you know, you, you draw, if points are within a certain distance. So for each distance, you have, a, you have a complex. And you compute the homology of that complex. And so what happens is that the homology changes according to the scale. And so what you, you, what you see is this kind of lines where, where you have a generator that starts and continues for a while and then drops. So the, the general idea with this is that the, the ones that persist for sufficiently long are the ones that contain some, uh, some more significant information. And so the ones that we're getting, you know, are, you know, that, that we focus on are just the ones that, that continue for a large set of scales. So you see, that, for example, you look at the edge zero, you see a lot which just die out after a while, after a short interval. And those are just accidental. They just depend on the fact that when you have a small scale, they're, they're points, so they're all, uh, but the ones that remain, contain some information. Like, you know, for example, with the Indo-European languages, you see only, at the end, you see only two that continue. Of course, if you go to a really large scale, they will become one, because eventually the two components overlap. But the fact that two of them remain for, for sufficiently many scales, I mean, it really corresponds linguistically to the fact that there are these two branches of the Indo-European family that are really kind of separate. So unless you go to very large distances, you, you will, they will not look like the same component. And the same thing for H1, you see a bunch of things that disappear, but then you see this one generator that continues. And so that one has something significant about it that the other ones don't have. And then that's, that's the idea. So uh, I also had a kind of a Pavlovian reflex. Uh, when you were talking about the H1 generator in, in Indo European languages and the Greek is like as some kind of vertex, can we think of that as some kind of blow up of a point that was there in Proto Indo European? Sorry, can you think of that? So if I understood correctly, there's some kind of shape like this. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. Is that some kind of blow up of a point? That's right. I mean, in Indo European, might have a point and then. Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I, I don't have a better explanation, but, it, but you're right, yes. I, no. uh, sorry. 
Yeah, it's, it's quite clear uh, how we can have the phylogeny tree, uh, starting with uh, uh, algebraic topology. Mm -hmm. But can you explain a little more wh wh what is the geometry of uh, the, persis the persistent? Uh, uh so, I mean, the, like, like, for example, the, we, we the persistent generator of H1 is really telling you that the data are sort of clustering around some closed curve right, in, in, your, in your ambient space. So, you know, it's, uh, it's this kind of picture. Yeah. Okay. So, so, can we see for mm -hmm. languages this right. kind of so the, geometric uh, it's Usually the point is, you know, it's difficult to visualize because your data lie in some very high dimensional space. So, what you would, no, if, you, if you're lucky in some cases, you can find like a good projection on to say that, that really visualizes the circle. And so, I, you know, I, I know we're sort of still playing with that. I, I don't know if, but you know, usually you don't directly see it because it's, it, it, you're in, inside some you know, um, space of some dimension, you know, hundred something dimensional space. So it's difficult to act. But you know, typically the fact that you have a generator of H1, persistent H1, tells you that there should be like a good angular coordinate, right, that parameterizes part of your set of data. And the question is, what does that coordinate mean, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of the, the data that you're trying, trying to classify? So that's the, the typical question that, you know, comes out of whenever you see a, a persistent generator of H1, the, the question, what, what is the, that angular coordinate? What is it measuring? Right? In, uh, right. So I, I don't have an answer for this, the syntactic structure of Indo-European languages, but, you know, it, 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 that something is saying that there's a, there's, there's a kind of angular coordinate that parameterizes part of the syntax of, of Indo-European languages. I don't know what that coordinate is and, and what it means, but that's what the, the structure is saying. <laughs> perhaps, uh, uh, yes, I have a question which is perhaps related to this one, uh, because uh, the first uh, representation, you, you start with uh, high-dimensional space, uh, that on each axis you put a, uh, a parameter and then you put frequencies. Oh, yeah. So, and you, you told us that parameters are not independent. So, right. in some sense, it's question very. That's method. right. So, there's really some kind of manifold in this space where the parameters lie, which should capture all the dependencies between parameters. And that, that's, that's another kind of question that, you no, know, is can one identify somehow this, uh, this sub manifold? But also this sub-manifold uh, uh, depends uh, on this uh, uh, choice uh, of uh, representing the parameter. If, if I meant uh, mixed, uh, uh, perhaps I could change the topology. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure no. if that would have an effect on the, to after all, no topology is kind of mm. uh, no, resistant to reparameterization if mm -hmm. it's really topological. But, you know, it's certainly true that, you know, the, there is, uh, you know, the, the, these parameters are not, not independent. The problem is that, you no, know, some dependencies are known linguistically, but there's a lot of dependencies that are not known. Yeah. And that one should be able to find purely by, by data analysis. And so, you know, principal component analysis, right, trying to reduce the dimensionality of this space. This is a, yeah, it's another thing that, you know, trying to understand, but well, we, so far, okay, I don't have, you know, definite data to, to present yet on that. But, I mean, it's one of the main questions, is what is the, what is the actual dimensionality? Yeah, and it could be also a probabilistic dependency yeah, that it used not only the mean, but uh, more of the... Uh, That's right, of yeah. The variable. That's so right. Uh, uh, just a last question. Last question. Do, do you know this work of Tenier, Tenier which was uh, took by, uh, taken by, by Tom and mm -hmm. Petito? Do you have a look at that? Because it was a tentative to use singularity and topology. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, remember. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if that, that can be used for this, uh, this type of. Uh, analysis of doing it, so, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I don't know. So perhaps I thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>